the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Judy Hancock Holland. Um, now, uh, Judy is a resident of Nanaimo, and she's passionate about embracing the beauty of everyday life. She enjoys making photos to delight the eye and move the heart. Now, Judy was the gold winner, gold medal winner at last year's, um, I think it's called the Harbor City Salon. Uh, Judy, if I've got that right, um, in Nanaimo. And um, this year, she has been asked to exhibit her work in Barcelona. Um, wow. She received an honorable mention in the 50 Julia Margaret Cameron competition. Thank you, Jerry. I'd like to start off this evening by inviting you to think about what goes into composing a beautiful piece of music. The composer must master many musical techniques and devices. She has a multitude of instruments, voices, key signatures, time signatures, tempos, and techniques available, and selects and combines them creatively and carefully to craft an exquisite auditory experience for the listener. Every note contributes to that. Mastery of the building blocks is essential and when combined with vision and heart and soul can lead to magnificent art. This is a brilliant portrait of Pablo Casals by the famous Canadian photographer, Josef Karsch. Here we see meticulous attention to composition. Everything in the frame contributes to the visual experience. The light is exquisite. The defocused frame on the right gives us the impression that we are peeking in on a private moment. The placement of the subject at the bottom center of the frame adds gravitas to the image and the light from above adds a hint of the divine in this cold stone room. Even the fact that Cassells has his back to us reinforces the intimacy of the moment. Karsh has used the building blocks of his craft in the service of his vision with heart and soul to create a masterpiece. I don't expect to ever achieve the level of a Karsh, but I am inspired by him and by others at that lofty level. So I keep practicing and aiming high, and I know that you and I have the same building blocks available to us that these giants have. Tonight and during part two on November 30th, we're going to look at some of those building blocks and how to use them to create great images. There's a lot to think about in composition, and this isn't even an exhaustive list. Working with these building blocks can help us refine our visual skills and nothing will improve our photography more than learning how to see and improving how we see. Even the world's best musicians practice scales and finger exercises or voice exercises. And similarly, photographers at every skill level can benefit from consciously practicing with our building blocks too. Compositional tools alone won't create a wow image any more than just putting a bunch of notes on a piece of paper will create a musical masterpiece. But mastery of compositional tools is a necessary part of creating great images. What I call soul is the other part that brings an image to life. And that's a topic for a whole other presentation. I've chosen a bunch of my images to share with you tonight and to deconstruct to show you how you might use some of these building blocks. Let's begin by talking about lines and leading lines. A leading line is a line, either literal or implied, that leads the viewer into the image to what you want them to see. It can add a feeling of depth. In photography, that's important because photography is a two-dimensional medium trying to depict a three-dimensional reality. And this leading line idea helps to, contr to contribute to creating that third dimension. Here, the bright line of the wave brings your eye first to the rocks, and then as it goes off to the left, leads your eye over to the lighthouse, which is exactly where I want you to look. Similarly, in this image, the path and the edge of the grass form a leading line to lead your eye to the gate. Here's an example where the line isn't literal but the line of the rocks curving up towards the lighthouse acts as a leading line. A curve, especially an S-curve, can be a very effective leading line 
leading you through the image, as here where our eye follows the river around the bend and up to the peak. This is true not only in landscapes, but even in abstracts. Here you notice that the leading line coming in from the lower left leads our eye right up towards and around the spiral. Not all lines are leading lines, though. Only the lines that lead your eye into the image can be considered leading lines. So in this example, the path is a leading line taking you into the image. The edges of the flower beds do the same thing. And even the upright of the cross could be considered a leading line. However, the cross piece on the cross is not a leading line, as it doesn't lead our eyes into the subject. Here, the road is not a leading line. In fact, if it were brighter, it would draw the eye out of the image, and that wouldn't be something we want to do. But the lines of rock and cloud lead you to the main image. Here, the lines of the image draw the viewer into and right through the image and contribute to the sense of depth. So this is a very strong example of an image where leading lines are a major building block that's been used. So let's leave aside leading lines now and look at other kinds of lines and the effects that they have on an image. Horizontal lines are very stable and calming. This is not a leading line. If you want to create a feeling of peace or stability in an image, look for horizontal lines. I find it difficult to carry off horizontal lines effectively. I actually found very few examples in my own work, but this one of a boat at rest in a harbor has that feeling of stability and peace about it that is partly created by the horizontal lines or near horizontal lines in the image. Vertical lines, on the other hand, can create a feeling of power, strength, solidity, or growth. This intentional camera movement shot of a forest is an example of the vertical lines contributing to a sense of solidity and growth. Much modern architectural photography also uses vertical lines to suggest solidity and even power. I don't have examples of that in my work because I don't tend to shoot modern architecture, but you'll see some of my architecture photographs a bit later. I like to use these two images to illustrate the difference in feeling that you get when you use a diagonal line as opposed to horizontal or vertical. Diagonal lines tend to be much more dramatic and dynamic. So notice the difference between these two images. They're the same mirrored flower, but the first one feels much more stable and the second one has more energy and dynamism simply because we've created some diagonal lines. In this image, I went directly to a diagonal line treatment because I wanted that tension, that feeling of one blossom reaching for the other one. I didn't even try this one with vertical or horizontal because I knew I wanted the dynamism of the diagonal line. In this seascape, I've used the horizontal lines of the horizon and the islands to give a feeling of stability and peace and then diagonals and bright colors in the sky to add a sense of dynamism. I was trying to create a sort of heaven-earth dichotomy with the solidity of the earth and the more airy dynamic of the sky. My favorite genre of photography is probably minimalism. I do a lot of minimalist shots and I teach about minimalism. Sometimes you don't need much more than just beautiful lines and curves and light to make an image that really sings. It seems logical to move on from considering the effects of lines on our compositions to looking into shapes and forms and how they can be used to enhance an image. This is something I learned about from Freeman Patterson in a workshop that I did with him four or five years ago. He really emphasized this. When you look at a scene or a subject, break it down to very basic shapes and use those shapes as the foundation of your composition. Usually you'll only have two or three main shapes that can provide that framework. These rectangles in this image contribute to the feeling of peace and stability. Here we see rectangles once again. 
but also the circles of bokeh and the shapes of the hanging droplets. Practice and train yourself to pick out shapes everywhere like a child does. When a child is learning their shapes, they're pointing out circles and triangles and squares all around them. We need to retrain ourselves as adults to see those shapes in addition to seeing what we see in objects. So in this scene, we see doors and walls and letters. But we can retrain ourselves to also see rectangles, circles, triangles, and other shapes. When I looked at this image for this presentation, I looked above the door and I thought, hmm, I see a letter D. But if I look as a child looks, I might also see a circle cut in half. That's what I mean by seeing shapes. This old home is a riot of rectangles, but also triangles, lots of them, which are very powerful shapes to use. Look for the triangles when you're looking at composition of a scene. Triangles don't have to be literal to be effective in your composition. Sometimes they can be implied and also have an effect. In this image, which I call Bridge Under Starlight, there are very strong implied triangles in the image, as well as the rectangle formed by the cello at the bottom. We can see shapes when we create an image, but we can also create shapes. In portrait photography, there's an axiom that says if it bends, bend it. And uh, that can lead to creating triangles that are visually appealing in your portrait. If you're shooting more than one person, rather than having them stand side by side, try a different kind of arrangement that creates a triangle, and you'll find you have a more interesting photograph. When I went to shoot this portrait of some of my family, I didn't want to just line them up in two or three rows. I wanted to have a more interesting composition. And so I positioned each person so that the heads and um, other areas of bodies like the bent knees and bent elbows created triangles. And I think that really serves the composition well. I've um, drawn one of the triangles on here, but if you look, you can see many, many more triangles in the composition. Again, the triangles don't have to be literal triangles. You can have a much more subtle approach. In this image, the curve is quite pronounced. The triangle is less so. Even a subtle triangle like this can add interest to an image. So even if it isn't readily apparent that you have shapes in your subject, look for shapes that you can either notice and use or create. This subject has some obvious shapes in the blossoms on the branch and on the table, and also in the shape of the vase. But if we look closely, we can also see that there's an implied triangle in the whole composition, which helps it kind of hang together. Look for shapes in landscapes as well. In this landscape, the triangular shape of the mountain peak is very, very obvious. Sometimes you have to look a little more closely, but try to compose your landscapes so that there are shapes to add to the comp composition and its appeal. While patterns and repetition, lines and light are strong components of this image, look at all the triangles. Every large leaf and all the small leaves that make them up are full of triangles and that adds to the interest. Circles are another shape that can be used to enhance a composition. In here, there's obviously the large circle formed by the outer peri perimeter of the blossom, but there are a whole bunch of other smaller concentric circles within that. And do you also see all the triangles? There's triangles all over the place in this image. You also see patterns, texture, light, contrast of color and tone, negative space and balance. This is an example of an image where many different building blocks have been used together to create an image that has some impact. You can also use implied circles in an image. We don't always need to see the whole shape. Our eyes, or more accurately, our brains, will fill in what's missing. This image is, has many circles and implied circles in it, but also triangles in the spokes and the chrome on the left. 
When you're at a difficult venue like a car show, look for shapes and other building blocks. It can be difficult to get a good image of a whole car because of so many other cars and people around, but you can find some very interesting images by focusing on shapes. This rusty old car in uh, Jerome, Arizona, in a ghost town area, really pulled me in because of the strong shapes. We see strong circles here, more than one. There are triangles and there are other shapes and lines, rectangles, plus a wonderful texture and color and tones that all comes together to make it quite an engaging image. While they're not closed shapes like rectangles and triangles, curves can be very compelling shapes in and of themselves. I've created a very large collection of calla lily photos based solely around their curves. And here we have an example of a semi-abstract image made from a calla lily laying on its side. The whole image is curves and triangles. When you're looking at a scene or a subject and imagining how you might use the shapes, try squinting when you look at the subject. Sometimes that will help the shapes stand out more. Or when you've got an image that you've taken in your camera, look at the image as a small thumbnail and see if the shapes stand out to you. And you can carry this to the extreme, creating abstract art that is just about curves, and in this case, color and tone. These both started out as images of tulips. Our human aesthetic sense is very drawn to the softness of curves, and they can make wonderful abstract images. So when does shape become form? Shape is a two-dimensional thing, whereas form is three-dimensional. What makes the difference is tones and light and shadow. They are what turn shapes into forms. If you were drawing a ball with a pencil on a piece of paper and you drew the circle, it would look very flat. It's only when you start to add in the shading that you start to bring about a sense of the third dimension and a feeling of this as an object. Here you see very strong shapes in both the building and the sky. The sky looks quite flat and that's fine, but the shading on the building is what gives it form. You can see a similar effect here. There are very strong shapes, but the shadows add depth to bring about a sense of form. I shot this lighthouse from several different angles. As I moved around it, I realized that if I wanted to highlight the form of the structure, I was going to have to shoot it with side light. And so I walked around until I could see the gradation of shadow on the side of the lighthouse, and that's what gives it form and three-dimensionality. I found this scene in Santa Fe so very inviting, and I think it's another good example of how the shadows and the shadings, the gradation of light and shadow, bring about a sense of form. Of course, this this principle of creating form applies not just with architecture, but all kinds of subjects. As a print, and even on the screen, this seems to protrude right off the page. The lens, in particular, seems to poke right out of the image. Notice the light and shadow producing that form, particularly in the lens. I love the curves here, but it is the light and shadow that really bring out that third dimension and give them form. These feel almost like sculptures that you could, you could touch, not like flat images. This has to be my favorite building to photograph. It's a, a church in Rancho de Taos, New Mexico. We see very strong shapes here, but it's the light and the tones that give it dimension once again. In this closer view of the back of the church, you can see again the gradation of light and shadow, particularly on the rounded form at the bottom left, gives it that sense of bulk and three-dimensionality. This image also demonstrates the rule of odds, which says that groups of odd numbers of things are more attractive to our eye than groups of even numbers of things, especially threes. Even an abstract can have form if there is shading. This doesn't appear flat, even though we have no idea what it depicts. It does have a sense of depth just because of the shading in it. Deciding where to place your subject in the frame is a vital part of composition. Very often it makes sense to place your subject off-center using the so-called rule of thirds or the golden ratio, Fibonacci spiral, etc. We don't want to be bound by these ideas, but we do want to understand how they work and be guided by them. 
there will be times to toss these ideas out the window, and we can do that most effectively when we really understand the principles. Like a violinist who wants to play jazz and learns classical music first, working with the principles of subject placement will help you to build the foundational skill you need to decide what is most effective for the effect you want to achieve. In this image, I've placed the orcas on the one-third line. This image also uses the rule of space, which means that the orcas have room left to swim ahead of them. In most cases, you'll want to have more space in front of your subject than behind it. You can see here that if you don't leave space in front of the subject, they feel crowded and the feeling of expansive freedom is lost. There may be times when you want to do this for a particular artistic effect, but it's important to understand the principle and take it into consideration. I have a friend who is a very accomplished artist in painting and fiber arts as well as photography, and she knows very well that there's a rule that says you don't cut people's heads off. She cuts people's heads off all the time, and she does it in an informed, intelligent way to serve her artistic vision. It works. Here, I've placed the center of the flower on the one-third line over to the right, and yet it's about halfway up the frame, so not on an intersection, but it still works. This one I've done in quite a similar way, just on the other side of the frame, and again, I think it works. When composing a landscape, of course, you can't move the subject around, so that's where you need to move around. A few steps to the right or the left can make a big difference in how your subject appears in the frame. So walk around before you raise your camera or plant your tripod in one spot. In this image, the main subject on the far left is balanced by a larger area of space on the right. Notice as well the subtle leading lines of the tire tracks and the road to guide our eye to the main subject. In this composition, I've placed the two main points of interest on two of the intersection lines according to the rule of thirds. The implied diagonal line between the rock and the ship suggests movement, while the faint horizon line, horizontal of course, adds to the feeling of peace. Here the main points of interest in the image fall close to the intersection points. I didn't deliberately set it up that way with the intersection points in mind, but when you compose deliberately for a long time, that starts to become second nature. If you're a beginner, it can be helpful to turn on the grid on your viewfinder that shows the, the rule of thirds overlay. And then when you've gained more experience, you can turn that off and it will sort of be built into the way you see things. When you're shooting portraits, it can often be advantageous to place the eyes on or above the one-third line. Try thinking about this as related to balance. The visual element of the main subject is balanced by the rest of the frame, in this case some blank space. Often this works well by putting the subject off-center and just balancing it with other elements, whether they are objects or space. And sometimes another choice works better. We'll look at a few examples like that in a moment. Here I've placed the boots off center with the toes pointing into the frame to keep your eyes in the frame. So your eye looks at the boots, the shaft of the boots, down to the toes, and then goes up to see that interesting textured screen door and comes back around to the boots. Keep your eye in the frame that way. Imagine if I had taken those boots and rotated them about 45 to 90 degrees so that the toe was pointed out of the frame to the right. It just wouldn't work as well because our eyes would be led out of the frame instead of into it. The whole point of this image is the point of contact, the connection between the little girl and the horse. And that point of contact is quite deliberately placed on the intersection of the thirds lines. The girl's body itself goes up the one-third line and the horse comes in approximately a third of the way down. But it's that point of connection between them that is the main purpose of the photograph and placing it on that one-third intersection helps to make that point. I love cellos and cello music 
And in this composition, I wanted the classical feel of a cello, but I also wanted the passion. I wanted some dynamism in this. And so I placed the strings of the cello approximately on the one third line to, to help convey some of that dynamism of the composition. Here's exactly the same subject shot with a totally different feeling. Here I was going for more of a feeling of seriousness and dignity. You can use your compositional building blocks to communicate the message you want to communicate. If I know that a centered object brings more of a feeling of weight and dignity to an image, then I can use that to communicate. This image is part of the series that Jerry mentioned that will be exhibited in Barcelona next year. It's a series of portraits of elders' hands. And here, I wanted a sense of grace and flow, because that's very much the feeling that I had watching this potter work. So I used some rule of thirds techniques here. And you may notice that I've broken a, I've broken a basic photographic rule that says you should never have a body part coming out of nowhere, sort of disembodied. And that's exactly what I've done with the potter's right hand. It comes out of nowhere, but that's part of the message for this. I call this image Creatrix. This is another photograph in the same series, but here I centered the subject because I wanted to contribute to conveying the sense of gravitas. I loved this this woman's appearance. She seemed so strong and centered and solid and wise and yet also soft. And so I called this grace and grit and centering the composition helped to bring about that feeling of solidity that I was going for. In this case, I was on a small ferry crossing from Nanaimo to Gabriola Island and this freighter was, or maybe tanker, was uh, anchored and I was overwhelmed with the bulk of it, the size of it. It felt almost foreboding and threatening and I knew that if I was going to convey that sense then I needed to center my composition. It brings about a, a, an emphasis of the bulk and the stability. It's an imposing image largely because it's shot head on. I actually have sort of a mantra that I keep in my mind when I'm shooting that says very few things are best shot head on, but this is an exception, I think. This image was kind of fun to create. I've placed the beak and the tufts of the ears on the third intersections, but in this case, I intentionally put the eye right smack in the middle of the frame because I had read somewhere that if you do that and then you walk around looking at the print, the eye seems to follow you. It's kind of a spooky effect and it actually works. So you can see that while we don't need to slavishly follow the rules, such as the rule of thirds, it's helpful to understand the principles and use them to create images that express our vision for the shot. Let's move on to another building block. I find the psychology of aesthetics really fascinating and I'd love to learn more about it. Our eyes are drawn to certain things in a scene or an image, and one of those things is patterns and repetitions. Our eyes, our brains actually, enjoy patterns, and we can use that fact in creating engaging images. This image is all about patterns and repetition. We have the, pat the repeating uh, thorns on the cactus, we have the repeating shadows, and we have the repeating lines of the structure of the body of the cactus. I use the light to emphasize the pattern. Often I shoot plants in soft, diffuse light, but cactus is spiky, and hard light emphasizes this by making hard, spiky shadows that echo the pattern. Nature is full of patterns and repetition, and it's wonderful to look for those. This subject is soft, so soft light enhances the soft character of the subject. We've all seen many images of rose petals, and I think the reason for that is that our eyes are very drawn to that kind of soft pattern full of curves and repetition. This rose was shot in a dark room, light painted with an LED flashlight. Often, although not always, Pattern is enhanced when you take away the color from an image, especially if the light is really good. 
Color tends to be like that loud kid in class who's always, look at me, look at me, look at me, and there's no room for anything else. When we take the color away, other aspects of the composition stand out more. In this case, the repeating pattern. While patterns are ubiquitous in nature, human-made structures can also contain really interesting patterns and repetition. This was shot in a church in Vancouver just before the beginning of a concert, and I would dearly love to have access to this church sometime when I could go in by myself without distractions and really take many photographs of this subject because the patterns are so interesting. The light and patterns and repetition in this scene really drew me. I was sitting in a restaurant in Vancouver having breakfast and I, I glanced this out of the corner of my eye and I said to my husband, hold on, I'll be right back. I've got to go shoot this. It was just such an interesting combination with the light emphasizing the patterns. This was another scene that just grabbed me. I was sitting in a workshop, ironically enough, on composition and uh, the light just came in through these blinds and, and lit up this chair in this way and I could hardly sit still until a break when I could grab my camera and go capture that. Here's another car example. This is a wonderful old Duesenberg that is in the car museum in Wetaskiwin, Alberta. And like many venues like that, it's hard to get a clear shot of the whole vehicle. But by honing in on these patterns, I felt like I captured some of the essence of the car. Here we come back again to my favorite building. And I use this one to illustrate the fact that even if repetition isn't the major feature of an image, it can still enhance the image. Here the birds along the top of the wall and the rocks at the bottom add to it. It's quite a different feeling than the version you saw of this building earlier without the birds. And this is a good example of the building blocks of shapes, forms, and repetition used together. This is a composite that I shot over two or three days as this amaryllis bloomed. I just left it in the same place and the same sort of light and then composited the four different stages of its development to show the growth. The repetition shows the growth. So in this case, the repetition doesn't have to be exact. We get the idea. Patterns that are interrupted or imperfect can be even more visually interesting than those that are completely regular. Here, the gills of the mushroom form a pattern, but they aren't entirely uniform. The variation within the pattern creates more visual interest. This one is a little more quirky. Here we have repetition, but it's interrupted by the fact that you can't see the reflection of the third shell. This was shot um, on a flat surface and then rotated 90 degrees clockwise just to give it a little quirkier sort of feel. We can observe and capture patterns in our subjects, but we also can use the technology available to us to create patterns. Here, I've used in-camera multiple exposure to create some repetition. Of course, you could also do this in post. The technological tools we have available to us these days are really quite wonderful. This is a kaleidoscope look created out of a smoke photograph. You can also mirror images to create repetition and patterns. So here you have the trees on either side that are mirrored. And then as you get closer to the middle of the composition, you can see all kinds of interesting patterns. I call this one the throne of the forest king. This kind of altered reality shot is kind of fun. Not all subjects work well for this, but it's just fun to experiment. If you look at this shot of the Japanese painted fern that you saw earlier, now it's mirrored. And as you look up the center, up and down the center of the photograph, I can see a number of faces in there. I can see sort of a witch doctor figure. I can see a lion right in the middle. I can see a Buddha. I can see an angel. It's just fun to engage the brain with this kind of imagery. Here's another mirrored image where I can see some different characters right in the center, um, vertical line through the center of it, and some interesting repetition. I played with this one quite a bit. Remember what I said about breaking up patterns? This was kind of fun. I just took the pattern, the symmetry, and then introduced an element that was not mirrored. 
I call this one the portal because to me the the arbutus and the beach create sort of a magical feeling and then you go through that portal and you see the orcas and they are such mysterious and magical creatures I just thought the two went together. Here's another image created in that same vein. What I did here was I left the top portion of the image as it was shot and then I mirrored from the flat roof line at the top all the way down so that part is mirrored but then I wanted to play with it to make the brain wonder a little bit so if you look at the base of the cross you'll see quite a pronounced pattern and yet when you look on the ground there you'll see a stone on the left that is not mirrored on the right similarly at the top of the square part of the church you'll see a water stain on the right hand side that is not mirrored on the left hand side and there's a stone on the on the bottom left of the wall that isn't on the right hand side of the wall. So all of these things go together to sort of engage the mind. Our brain likes to engage with things and try to figure them out. So this is just kind of fun to play with. Contrast is another building block that we can use in our compositions. We know that the eye is drawn to areas of contrast and this can work for us or against us. The key is to be aware of that and to use contrast effectively to draw the eye where we want it to go and make sure that there isn't contrast in another area of the image that we don't want the eye to be drawn to. Let's start with color contrast. We know that that's very effective in drawing the eye. It's no accident that so many businesses use color contrast in their logos. Think about the blue and yellow of Ikea, the red and white of Coca-Cola, and there are innumerable other examples. Mother Nature also uses contrast to get attention. The contrast of yellow and purple at the center of this winter pansy draws the attention. Along with the curves and the tonal contrast, it makes for an interesting image. Colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel are often referred to as complementary colors or opposite colors, and they create very effective contrasts that draw our eyes. We enjoy this kind of color contrast. When you're working with color, keep in mind that warm colors like red, orange, and yellow draw the eye more than cooler colors like blue and green. Think about a sunset. Even though the blue areas might be larger than the orange or pink or red areas, it's the warmer colors that your eye is attracted to. This can work for you or against you. Even a small pop of red where you do want it will draw the eye. If it's in your main subject, that will really help the image. But a spot of red where you don't want it will also draw the eye and can take attention away from your main subject. So keep contrast in the areas you want to draw the eye to. And that applies to all kinds of contrast, not just color contrast. Not a great photograph here, but I use it to indicate to you just how quickly you notice the red and how much more slowly you'll notice the cooler colors like the green and the blue. As soon as you see this, the red hits you right between the eyes, the yellow is not far behind, but those cooler colors are less noticeable. Another kind of contrast that we can use as a building block is tonal contrast. Here the area of greatest contrast is the silhouetted ship against the streak of light on the water, and that's exactly where I want your eye to go first. The contrast within the sky also draws the eye so that your eye moves between the ship and the sky and that's what I want you to look at. The low contrast in the foreground, the water part, keeps your eye in the frame so that it doesn't wander away from where I want you to be looking. Dark skies like this were a staple of Ansel Adams. He used filters and then dodging and burning in the darkroom to achieve dark skies to contrast with his subjects. We can do the same in our digital darkrooms. Tonal contrast is very important in black and white, and it's easy to see in black and white, but it can also be used very effectively in color. Mastering tonal contrast is all about learning to see light and shadow. And I found this quite intimidating when I first started learning to see light. I didn't even know how to go about that until somebody suggested to me that if you want to see light, look for darkness and then look for the contrast between them and the gradations between the two. So practice everywhere, even without a camera. 
when, when you're walking, when you're a passenger in a vehicle, in harsh light or softer light at various times of day, look for the shadows, look for the light, look for the transition between the two. I have often heard photography teachers say that you shouldn't shoot in harsh light. In fact, I've heard one photographer teacher on uh, the internet say that between 10 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon, you should put your camera away and have a snooze. Well, if I'd done that, this picture never would have happened because that's exactly the kind of light that produces high contrast, and sometimes that's what you want. This photograph would not have been possible in anything but harsh light because you wouldn't have had the dark shadows and the brightness together. Be mindful about how you use contrast. Low-key, high-contrast work tends to be very dramatic, so if you want to communicate drama, use that. Use high contrast. In this image, it's not drama that I was wanting, quite the opposite. I wanted to capture the softness of the models and the tenderness of the relationship between them. High-key, low-contrast emphasize those qualities. So use contrast to enhance the feeling or the story that you're wanting to convey. This low contrast, high key shot captures some of the delicacy of the blossoms and the placement in the frame kind of implies a relationship between them. I really like using high key to emphasize the softness of flowers and the sensuality of the curves of a calla lily. Always remember that contrast draws the eye. You can use this to your advantage, but it can backfire. The first time I printed this image, as it was coming off the printer with the bottom part of the image coming out first, suddenly I saw an area of high contrast, which I've got rid of now, but just at the top of the stem where it, where it transitions into the flower, there was too much darkness, and it was just so glaring when it came off the, the printer. So I used a luminosity mask to brighten up that area of darkness and get rid of that area of high contrast. And now the whole image is sort of low contrast and dreamy and that's exactly the kind of feeling that I wanted to evoke. Our building blocks do have an impact on the emotional uh, effect of our images and we need to be mindful of that. Another kind of contrast is the contrast between feelings and meanings, sort of a juxtaposition. And this may be the most challenging kind of contrast to depict. In this image, we see the contrast of young and old. And so that's a juxtaposition, a contrast of meaning. But if we look more closely at this image, there's another kind of juxtaposition happening here as well. There's a contrast between the expected and the unexpected. When you first look at this image, at least when I look at it, I see an old lady cuddling a baby. But if you look closely, particularly at the hands of the baby, you'll recognize that this is not a baby, it's a doll. And that changes the whole meaning of the composition. It is so unexpected. I think there was probably some dementia going on here and this doll had become a comfort object for this woman. I call the image Mothering Remembered. Here, the contrast in textures stands out quite obviously, but in this case, the textures also help convey a contrast in meaning and feeling as well. We have the solidity and rough texture of the tree contrasted with the softness and grace of the poppy that is leaning on the tree. And to me, those things represent the masculine and feminine principles. I call this one yin and yang. Returning to this image, we see tonal and textural contrast quite obviously, but also there is a contrast in meanings. Things that are solid and stay put, contrasted with the mistiness of the ship moving away, creates a contrast in meaning. Here we see lots of tonal contrast, but there's also a contrast between the life and motion and vitality of the young boy, contrasted with the flatness and the mystery represented by the shadow. Here the character of the two subjects is quite different. We have a feeling of delicacy and crispness in the orchid, and then we have the soft, indistinct character of the shadow. 
and the same time the shadow is grounded you see the base of the plant the the foundation of it and yet the flowers are just floating in space back to this church again we have the juxtaposition of the big solid enduring building literally built out of earth contrasted with the almost ephemeral ephemeral moving birds and yet both are suggestive of spirituality. The building is a church, and doves, of course, have special meaning within Christianity. When I walked around the front of that church, I was really amused by this juxtaposition. Here we have the solemnity and peace of this lovely uh, statue of St. Francis, juxtaposed with this whimsical, almost psychedelic background. I really don't know what that building was. It says jewelry above the door, but I think it was closed down, and I, I, have no, I would love to know the story. But we have the juxtaposition of the sacred and the secular together. So play with various types of contrast, and keep in mind that contrast of all kinds is one of the elements that draws the eye. Always be careful of that. Place it in such a way that it keeps the viewer's eye in the image, not on the edges leading them out of the image. I call this border patrol, where um, you look around the edges of your image to see if any of those elements are on the edges to draw the eye away. The last building block I want to talk about tonight is texture. Like contrast, texture is another element that draws the eye. A photo can be all about texture and be quite interesting. Freeman Patterson often shoots textures in nature and fills the frame with the texture. You can get some really interesting abstracts that way. I love old rusty things and the texture of those, so that's what I've been more drawn to. When we saw this image earlier, we talked about how side light reveals form. But side light is also wonderful for revealing texture, as you can see in the blocks under the whitewashed wall of the lighthouse. Here we have a number of different textures working together in this image. Notice the texture of the blossoms, but also the smoother texture of the vase and the two different textures of the cloth. Leaving the color out of this helps the viewer appreciate the texture. These blossoms are bright orange, and if I'd left the color in, you'd notice the texture much less. So it was the texture that drew me, and that's what I wanted to emphasize. So I left the color out. This image appeared in Photo News Canada a few years ago. It's a dramatic example of side light, in this case, indirect window light, showing texture. When I saw this dried blossom, I, I literally gasped. Uh, my sister showed it to me on a Skype call one day, and I thought, oh my goodness, I need to shoot that. So she kindly gifted it to me, and I set it up in such a way that the light would highlight the texture and bring that through. Here, the color isn't able to hog the center stage because the texture and the light are so strong. And the fact that it's only one color means that it is less likely to draw the eye away from the texture because there's no color contrast. Texture is really beautiful sometimes, and it can be enhanced in post, but be very, very careful. It's so easy to overdo it and get an unattractive, crunchy kind of look. Too much contrast, clarity, and sharpening can result in halos and a very unattractive image. The processing has to suit the image. These could have been really ugly if I'd gone too far with clarity or structure in post. Not everybody likes to shoot old things and dead things like I do. What if you're a landscape photographer? Well, you can find textures in landscapes too. Rock, trees, sky, and water all have textures that contribute. In this image of El Capitan, we have many textures. We have the rock, we have scrubby vegetation, and we have a nice smooth sky. And that contrast in textures is part of what makes the image work. Even animals have texture. I didn't have to shoot the whole elephant to get an image that was pleasing. Clothing has texture too. This is obvious in the dress, but it's also there in the sheen of the trousers, the shoes, and even the floor. People have texture too. Here we have the texture of the hands, the sweater, and the cane. You'll commonly see texture in shots of faces, and often it's overdone in post, particularly you see the gritty old man look. Sometimes that can be very effective and sometimes it, it does get overdone. 
A good way to not overdo the texture is to go back to a shot a few days after your initial post-processing work when your eyes are fresh and check to see whether you've achieved the effect you want. You may have to increase the effect or tone it down some to get what you were going for. I love the texture of Elder's hands and that's a major feature in my whole series on Elder's hands. I could have cranked up the clarity and the structure here but I wanted the image to show what I really saw and felt. Notice how the textures of the defocus sweater and the jeans sort of frame the hands which are the main focal point. Here we see textural contrast between the dried petals, the pottery bowl, and the glass tabletop. The soft side light shows the glossiness of the table, the smoothness of the bowl, and the dried out rougher texture of the petals. Again here, side light brings out the different textures in the brick, the wood, and the pottery jars. When I first started exploring texture, I thought mostly about rough textures, brick and rust and things like that. But texture can be very, very soft as well as rough. I kept the color in this image because the softness of the color works together and complements the softness of the texture rather than taking away from it. This brings us to the end of our presentation tonight, and I want to thank you once again for having me with you. I will be back for part two on November the 30th, when we'll look at light in, in quite a bit of depth. We'll also talk about depth, negative space, and touch on the rule of odds, vertical versus horizontal, framing, point of view, and balance. In the meantime, I would invite you to go and look at some of your best favorite images and ask yourself, what building blocks or visual tools are you already using? And what building blocks could you use to make stronger images? There are probably some that you don't use very much and practicing with those can build your skills just like practicing scales helps a musician build skills. And just experiment and play with it. Jerry asked me before I did this presentation to come up with a shooting assignment for you. And so this is what I'm going to suggest. These are the six building blocks of composition that we talked about tonight, and I would like to encourage you to choose only one or maybe two of these building blocks and make some images using those blocks. Then another week you might choose another one or two, and just work with each one of these until you start to get a, a feel for working with them and they start to become just a normal part of your repertoire. Thank you again for inviting me to do this presentation for you. If you'd like to see more of my work, you can do so at jhhphoto.com and my YouTube channel is easy to find and you'll find a few tutorials there and I hope to be making more as time goes by. Thank you again, have a great evening and enjoy playing with those building blocks.